on our farm where we've been really supported about exploring new technologies. I think something that's been the, it seems the most simple, but the most mental jump for a lot of people is changing how we soil sample. So rather than doing a grid sample, we actually moved to zone sampling. So to, to do that, we had the tool Varus. We had all of our, our maps Varus mapped. So that is taking the electric conductivity of our soil, giving us a water holding capacity zone that we could see. And so what we did is we broke those into basically three zones for us, um, a low, medium, and high. And then with those zones is what we took our soil sample parts from. So we started doing zone sampling and then we actually moved to composite zone sampling. So rather than having uh, 40 from the field, we could just in that one uh, zone in that one quarter, we could take three from that corner from uh, composites of those zones from a low, medium, high, and the same for those quarters. And that kept our cost. So we could go to every other year soil sampling or even every year rather than every three years of the grid sample. So it was able, we were able to get a lot more information on our field but in um, a way that's been scientifically um, university supported research. So um, the, the, the zone sampling has been really, and you don't need Varus to do zone sampling. There's some wonderful research out of the University of Colorado or Colorado State University, I think it is. Uh, Raj Koshal is kind of the father of that research and he's been, um, his research has been very impactful on our farm for that specific part of the research. Using precision technology has really allowed farmers to create different kind of management zones and actually manage their fields better based on those zones and expectations. Um, so rather than looking at each field as a standalone unit, if you look at it as a management zone, each field has a different target yield. With a different target yield, you have different inputs that you're gonna be applying to that uh, to either maximize the yield or minimize the inputs. If you know that a low yielding area isn't going to have the same results of adding extra inputs, why put it on? You're putting on costs that could be better applied to a different section of the field or just cut out of your program overall, therefore increasing your maximum ROI. And we've used several tools, once you create those zones, several tools in order to better manage our practices to that. We use variable rate irrigation to put more water on sandier areas and less on areas that have higher water holding capacity that have already been refilled by uh, rainfall. Uh, we use those zones to uh, do different seeding practices and seeding rates based on what the soil can support for different populations, as well as building uh, fertility on those zones um, and in season using drone imagery or satellite imagery to uh, ensure that our practices aren't uh, shorting in certain areas because as you become more adaptive you have more uh, room for error if you don't adjust in season to what the crops are telling you. And it definitely was a step-by-step -step process for us. Um, the, all the fields were started very mapped around 2011-2012 and we've had improvements every year as the technology improves. And with the first Varus, we started to run just a straight variable rate irrigation. And then we started to change that per crop. And then we realized uh, we could move to soil sampling per zone to get even more of a clue on fertility, which made us move to using a variable rate seeding rate with those zones. And then going to using the irrigation with the, that variable rate irrigation to actually variable rate fertigation. So we could do it where we put heavier in the heavier soils and lower in the lower, but we also would inverse that and we'd actually put less in that heavier soil and more in the sandier. So depending on the crop, the year, the weather, timing, timing we were able to have a lot uh, uh, more tools in our toolbox. So it was, it was definitely a step-by-step -step process and a learning curve, uh, but it, and we had a lot of support from the universities, from in-state, from the University of Wisconsin and then out-of-state Ohio, um, Indiana, Purdue, we had a lot of great um, support. You mentioned the support side, obviously, and, and uh, you know, the research and the education. Um, what's, uh, you know, from a, a support standpoint on the equipment side and the technology side, you know, I guess the, the infield, I mean, I know you guys are, are very progressive and, and like to do a lot of problem solving on your own, but, you know, maybe talk a little bit about that relationship you guys had, um, you know, with, with your equipment dealer in, in terms of the technology and, and maybe either some of the troubleshooting that you guys work together on or uh, just the service side in general. 
So with the precision technology, it was a lot of back and forth with the dealers, with the with any of the software support people. There was a lot of collaboration there. And then with our equipment, with the Orthman, um, there was a lot of support from our dealer and, and even more within the organization, I know. I think one of the neat things is uh, we have been looking at different practices, experiments, technologies uh, for years. Uh, so when we go to conferences or meet with a dealer rep, is they see that we're doing new practices. Um, so we can uh, brainstorm with them and try and figure out new ideas, or maybe they're coming to market with a new product or have a product that they've been wondering, can it be used like this? Uh, and we can come up with an idea to try and figure out if we can test that. We've worked with Orthman for many years and trying to figure out how we can utilize strip tilling in different practices or taking some of their farmers that they uh, highlighted as, as uh, best practices or people that are pushing the, the envelope and saying, hey, do you want to try this here? How would this work in your operation? Um, we've worked with McFarland Equipment on, on looking at trying to design new kinds of crimping units uh, between strip tilling or put it directly on planters. Don, um, Don had a, a trial up on our farm last year with the University of Wisconsin. And I, and I know you were on the Orthman, um, he were on the Orthman Farmers. Precision Tillage Council. Yep, yeah. for, for a couple of years there. And I know Orthman brought some, um, they had visitors from a Hungarian co-op and they brought them to our farm, to tour our farm for what we were doing. That was very humbling. And then with the software side, like SMS, we, I've been down to their, their headquarters, not just for training, but to mm -hmm. talk with them about improvements that might be a little more intuitive for some of the farmers that do have some trouble with their technology. And um, it's been... Well, and you've, you've worked with SMS on different kind of precision technologies, and we've already gone all the way to the level of having uh, someone such as John Deere and Orthman and other uh, people working together. Uh, we had an issue where we went narrower and narrower rows. We're not doing 30 inch rows. We went down to 22. Now, if we have a full tillage, uh, like we would do maybe for a snapping field, where you still, you can't have a cover crop because they have to get so close to the ground, yet we still see the results of strip tilling. How do you fit a 20 inch tire in an 18 inch gap and still drive straight? without uh, assing through the field. Uh, so we had people from uh, John Deere or Case along with Orthman trying to figure out best practices that we can do in order to help firm up that ground and retain um, traction on the ground and, and, and be able to still use RTK, which is precision technology that we've had for years, which was failing because of a new practice. Uh, so it took a lot of a lot of people together in the same room, scratching heads, trying to figure out a solution that wasn't going to cost tens of thousands of dollars, and eventually we got it. And I think it was, it's, it's not just it, it, one side, it's definitely back and forth where they come and help us, and then they'd call us and say, hey, we've got a new product or a new piece of equipment. Could we do some trials? So it's definitely a relationship that's both sides. So knowing that you might have to put a little extra work into it, but, and, and they might have to put some, a little extra work in your organization, but the, the results uh, really show that it's that sort of mutual benef mutual relationship is beneficial. Yes, a partnership. So thinking about the technology adoption you've had on the farm, is there uh, you know maybe one or two kind of points of pain that you guys uh, either encountered or, or, and overcame you know throughout the course of uh, of your your career, um, you know something that. Uh, you really wanted to improve on or, or just, you know, prove to be very problematic that either, you know, you got help on or you figured out yourself or you just said, forget it, it's not worth the time and effort. I think uh, for me, so I write all of the precision uh, software prescriptions and everything that's applied to our technology. And we've been working with uh, a dealer uh, that was helping me and, and letting me help use their software. Uh, because it just, they had so much to do and they're like, you understand it, go ahead and, and do what you need to do. And then they moved on, which means we lost that software. So being able to use, find that, that favorable rate irrigation prescription software mm -hmm. that the farmer themselves can manipulate because you know, oh, you know what? Even though the Varus said this was a sandy spot, and, but the elevation is super low, we actually have water standing here. So I need to manually change the prescription. The softwares and, and um, consultants might not know your fields like you do. So being able to have access to that uh, was about a year journey to find software and, and convincing the software companies that are 
in Australia or California that I know I'm a farm in Wisconsin, but I do know how to use it and let's work together and find out a solution. Another simple ex explanation is we added a variable rate pump to our system which had flow meters and, um, and a rate controller in order to, to put the right amount of product through our strip till. Um, and we kept on having pump failures where we didn't get enough volume. And we're putting organic product through, which uh, if you leave it in the tank, it will clump up and it'll create particles. Uh, so we kept on thinking that we were having issues uh, going through the flow meter and we switched parts out and we eventually replaced the whole pump. We didn't know if we broke a seal or we had enough grit in there that it wasn't working. So we changed seals and filters um, and found out eventually uh, that the manufacturer didn't realize all the scope of product we were putting in there and it came uh, came to the fact that we were just putting something that was too acidic and we needed a different class pump because we were we were dissolving the seals uh, so using multiple people in the same room trying to get the whole scope of what you're doing they didn't have all the information in the first place otherwise we would have hit the ground running and never had a solution however once once you get through, you take a step back because this always happens on your busiest day. So you don't have time to think about the problem. And as soon as you take a step back and have another mind working with you, you generally can find a solution uh, for moving forward uh, and decide whether that solution is gonna work for your operation or not, or if you just change your practices. Well, I think that that segues nicely, uh, you know, with kind of the educational side and what you guys have learned into, okay, I think one of the, the last things I wanted to talk about here, which I know is, uh, again, a part of the recognition uh, for the uh, Strip Till Innovator Program. Uh, and that's just uh, kind of the advocacy side and, and being good ambassadors of Strip Till and obviously uh, sharing what you've learned. And you guys have always been very good about doing that, uh, not only with us, but I know with, with other farmers in the industry as a whole. But um, just was hoping you guys could talk a little bit about, um, you know, the importance of that, you know, for you guys and, and I guess just the Strip Till community as whole. It, it You know, my experience, it tends to be a pretty tight-knit group and, and, you know, with, again, um, you know, the pockets and, and the relatively small but growing number, you know, of farmers that are adopting strip till, uh, there, there does seem to be a very much a network feel uh, to being able to share, so. I think because it's a practice that's a little bit newer or, or more of a niche that's moving to more mainstream, we've got that tight-knit community. It's, for us, the advocacy is we feel like we need to give back because the reason we are where we are is because of people who are already beyond where we had been. So by listening to the other advocates that were ahead of us in the field, having the publication or conferences, the strip till publication, the strip till conference, and, and the other conferences that are similar, going to the no-till conference, you're gonna find the strip till guys there and you can talk about how you're incorporating the no-till with strip till or vice versa. So having these uh, resources available and learning from them um, allows us to learn, but also share everything we've learned so that we could help someone that is in the beginning to get to a better place. And one of the favorite things that I have about sharing is often people get stuck in their own operation and how they do things. Um, and then if we start doing something else, and I'll start sharing it with a different operation, just completely different, different crops, different structure, different soils, and they'll say something, they'll take something that we're using and change it around. And I, I'm here thinking, I've never thought of that. Maybe it doesn't help my farm uh, because we don't have that scenario, but it's something that I had never com even considered uh, because I'm in my own sphere of influence. So when I share, I find I often learn two or three things that I had never even conceived. Um, and it makes me better for, uh, for doing it. Perfect. Uh, last question I had for you guys was, um, you know, thinking about the experience you guys have accumulated and, and uh, some of the lessons you've learned, um, you mentioned, you know, strip till being a relatively new practice, but a growing one. Um, and, and we do seem to find uh, farmers each year that are, are interested and, in, in, you know, wanting to explore uh, what strip till is all about or, or do some research on it. Um, what, what maybe one bit or a couple bits of advice would you have for a farmer that is thinking about, you know, getting in, taking the dive into strip till on what they need to know getting into the practice? One thing that I would say is looking at strip tilling, it does take, in, in my opinion, a couple years of learning and experience in the field in order to get it correct. 
And even if you're doing it right, it, it, it is a transformative process in a field or regenerative process that you may not see positive results or even equal results within the first year. And you have to have a commitment to an, an idea or concept rather than to a piece of equipment. Um, and understanding that and understanding that you are making a difference uh, and it will take a little time is something that you shouldn't, you may not necessarily see immediate results. Sometimes you do if you're those lucky ones, uh, but stick with it and give it a try and don't be afraid of failures. I, I would, I think that's a great answer. I, the only thing I would say is, is it does take a couple years. So maybe find a neighbor that you could share buying a piece of equipment or rent from a neighbor. Um, see what you can do to, to reduce some of those costs in those trial years, because that's, you know, a larger um, strain on your operation for a larger cost. So. Mm -hmm. See what creativity you can think of for um, keeping your costs a little bit lower so you won't be as um, feeling like you need to give up for when you do run into those issues mm -hmm. that we've all had.